Very good no. evening to one and all. Uh, we're a team of three. This is Alan Paltrow and uh, Tom and myself, Amrita. So we're going to be taking you through a stock valuation for Goldman Sachs. And as you can see, our recommendation based on our valuation and analysis is going to be a hold. Uh, just talking about a brief about the bank is, uh, as a whole, it's a global leading, you know, globally located leading investment bank and investment management. But as you all know, it's actually registered as a commercial bank, which means it gets a lot of benefits from the Fed. But on a public front, it is more, it's operating in terms of investment bank or investment management where it gives a lot of financial services to institutional clients and, you know, corporates and governments, etc. As you can see, it's publicly traded as GS on NYSE, Dow Jones Industrial, and uh, the founders basically were Marcus Goldman and Samuel Sachs. And as you can see on the map, it's kind of globally located, like uh, more than 30 to 30 or 32 offices in North America and South America, and uh, in the EMEA region as well, Europe, Middle East, and Asia, like Hong Kong, Singapore, and China, and also, you know, in the Australia as well. So it's kind of globally located. Their revenue is around 40,000 million as of now. Moving on to the leadership, uh, so we have actually just picked the top six in the executive office. Yes, we do have a woman on the board, but we, we've just picked six, uh, top six right now on the executive office. We also have about 14 on the board of directors as well. So talking about the executive office, of course, Lloyd Blankfin, he is the chairman and the chief executive officer, and he is also a Harvard graduate, law school, and, um, and mostly he is also co-head of CEO and chairman, and he's also on the Dean's Council of Harvard University and Board of De Dean's uh, Advisors on the Harvard University. Uh, Gary Cohen, who is the you know, president and chief operating officer, he also co-heads the securities division in Goldman, and he also heads the FICC, Fixed Income Currency and Commodities Division. He's also graduated from American University Cogot School of Business. Moving on to John, who is also the co-head of IBD since December 2002, and he's also a visiting committee for Harvard School of Business. Michael, head of FICC again, role, his role is mostly to coordinate the firm's business activities around the growth markets. And Harvey Schwartz, of course, he's a member of management committee, firm-wide risk committee, and steering committee on regulatory reform. And we also have Gregory, who is the general counsel head and co-head of legal department, which is very important again. Al Cohen, who is again the member of management committee, firm-wide client and business standards and committee and firm-wide investment committee, and he's obviously the vice president and the global head for compliance. Mark Schwartz, uh, president of Goldman Sachs Japan, he's also the uh, you know, chairman of Goldman Sachs Asia, member of management committee, and he's also on the board of dean of Harvard School, School College, Harvard Business School, and Harvard Kennedy School. So this is pretty much the leadership. Um, Moving on to social responsibility, as you can see, culture and principles of Goldman is extremely important, and this exactly is what defines the culture, defines the morale and value of the employees of Goldman. So they are in philanthropy, they are extremely involved, especially in corporate social responsibility, diversity, inclusion, and transparency is what really drives the firm. And as you can see, they have many philanthropy projects like 10,000 Women Entrepreneurship, they have community teamworks where I've been a part of it as well, and it's a great opportunity for you to just bring smiles on you know people with disability or people with underprivileged people and also you have the services and products division uh, under services pro division they have broadly categorized into investment banking investment management institutional client services and securities and you have the in investing and the lending uh, you know so under uh, investment banking they usually have the services where financing and merchant acquisition are underwriters and uh, they the industry sectors that you can see are what they cover so any company that falls under these industry sectors will be uh, leveraged they can leverage the investment banking financial services of the firm investment management you obviously have asset management which kind of caters to institutional clients and you have the private wealth management that caters to the h and i's the high net worth individuals who have net worth at least above 50 million and above uh, 50 million dollars and above and then you have the institutional client services which is mostly securities you have n number of products as well uh, you know offered under the securities that is the institutional clients as you can see the list of products offered under securities and investment management like the mutual funds alternatives the latest alternatives they have in the market is the liquid alternators liquid alternators which is doing pretty well and you have the wrap accounts variable institutes these are the, some of the and they also have customized indices that they offered under securities indices so this is a revenue segment that we've provided. As you can see clearly, the securities or the you know the institutional client services have been you know pretty doing very well, uh, starting from 2012, and now they're around 15,197 in USD millions. And investment banking was a pretty low initially in 2012, but it's ramped up 
across 2014. And uh, same with investment management, as they offer a variety of products in securities and investment management, that's why they kind of lead the revenue segment as well. Moving on to SWOT analysis uh, by Alan. Thanks, I'll be brief. Um, okay, so the opportunities and uh, uh, threats to the, oh, let me get over here. So I want to talk about the key growth drivers mostly. Uh, we're going to probably get rid we're not going to do the strengths and the weaknesses. We're going to take a look at mostly the opportunities and the threats. Uh, there's a big opportunity in wealth management as the number of high net, or high net worth individuals increases throughout the world, particularly in Asia. Uh, increased demand from BRIC nations, well, it's not really BRIC anymore because Russia really doesn't like, have access to capital markets. Uh, threats. Oh yeah, sorry. <laughs> uh, um, vol <laughs> volatile uh, regulatory environment, as we all know, there's been a lot of changes going on uh, in the capital markets and how they're structured. That's gonna you're gonna see that in the uh, in the ratio analysis as well. Heightened foreign exchange risk, uh, we're seeing that too, and interest rate risk uh, is higher than ever. Well, Okay, um, so this is just the, the ranking according to assets and also the market share. As you can see, that uh, they're, they uh, command like an 8% um, investment uh, banking market share, and they're fifth overall in U.S. banks. Uh, the financial condition, um, so the net profit, uh, let's see, net profit margin, 23%, fairly healthy. Uh, ROA is uh, relatively strong as well. Um, the return on uh, equity is 11.5, much stronger than J.P. Morgan and Morgan Stanley. Uh, we're going to say that, uh, that's probably due to the higher leverage. Uh, we'll get to that in a second. Um, debt to equity uh, is uh, relatively high, uh, but not too, like as you can see, it's the same as Morgan Stanley. JP Morgan has a much stronger uh, uh, figure. Interest coverage, um, uh, they do actually, okay, so being hi highly levered, they do actually, uh, they're able to make relatively strong commitment to their uh, interest. Let's see, equity ratios. Um, uh, the P.E. ratio is about what you'd expect, uh, it's about average. The dividend payout ratio is rather low, although they're doing uh, a fairly aggressive dividend increase year over year of 9%. The, uh, the revenue growth is kind of funky, and this is where you'll see a lot of the numbers have been spoiled by different uh, changes in the regulatory environment and also the structuring of the companies and their capital. Uh, the revenue is only 1%, uh, J.P. Morgan is down 2%. Uh, operating income is going up uh, compared to Morgan Stanley and J.P. Morgan, so that's strong. Net income has uh, been relatively weak, although positive, which is good. And uh, the earnings per share growth is about 10%, which is not as good as we like to see, so it's relatively weak. Overall, we'd say it's about average. Um, we just want to talk about the assumptions that we made for the weighted average cost of capital. Uh, the risk, uh, we got the risk-free rate at 2%, the beta at 1.57. The expected market return, uh, just be advised that this is uh, subtracting the risk-free rate already, so it's really at 8.5. Um, and that gives us an expected return on equity of 12.2%. And uh, we got the debt cost by looking at similar duration bonds, and also we know that uh, Goldman can borrow from the Fed at like nearly the discount rate. I'm sorry, the risk-free rate. So uh, that gives us, when we put in the weights of 72 and 27 percent respectively, we get the weighted average cost of capital of 4.8 percent. Tom, do you like this? Uh, okay, moving on to. Uh, Valuation with the perpetuity model. Uh, basically, we uh, arrived at a stock value that, in accordance with the perpetuity perpetuity model, was less than the current price, um, which is kind of interesting. Um, basically, we kind of assumed conservative rates and were pretty skeptical. Um, so, forecasting out, we used low rates. Gordon growth model, uh, another valuation method. We arrived at actually a number greater than, significantly greater than the current price. Um, again, this is using our numbers, we laddered our percentages going lower out in time. So, the multiples approach to this valuation um, here is kind of interesting because it went. The, the stock value was actually less than the current price. So we're kind of like right in the middle. Discounting cash flow, this valuation method, uh, we arrived at a price, again, it was kind of going up and down, significantly higher than the current price. Uh, basically, I like to have the matrix here so you guys can see the big picture and we kind of used a blend of the perpetuity model, the um, 
Gordon growth model, the multiples approach, and the discounting cash flow uh, to, to arrive at a medium uh, value of the stock around 203.99. So basically looking at all these models, our intrinsic value of 203.99 is pretty close to the current price, so I think it's a fair assumption to say that we should hold and trade recommendations. We should write call option. We should write call options and write put options. Great. Any questions? Thank you. Yeah. Great. I'll do